I still would hope that somehow, you know, there will be a resolution to this situation, which will not necessitate the release of this video, which we're filming in April of mm -hmm. 2018. I, I think that at this point, it's important to put some things on the record that um, provide a deeper context to what actually took place. The suggestion that I get involved with the alt-right at a high level mm -hmm. and integrate the various institutions uh, of what became the alt-right corporation, and these were not all under the rubric of the alt-right at the time. Uh, some of them were classified as new right, others identitarian, etc. I mm -hmm. mean, Arctos Press, which had published my book Prometheus and Atlas, had no definite ideological platform. Mm -hmm. Uh, but the suggestion that I integrate the alt-right and um, form a, a corporate structure uh, that would um, bring Arctos Media, the publishing company that had published Prometheus and Atlas, together with Red Ice uh, Radio and Television and the NPI Think Tank, is a suggestion that was made and... Um, conversations, discussions with certain individuals who uh, I identified as connected to the Jellyfish Private Intelligence Agency in uh, the blog post. And ultimately, I did reveal the name of Michael Bagley, who was the president of Jellyfish, uh, who has been written about um, in mainstream media. There's mm -hmm. an article in Wired about Jellyfish and an article in Mother Jones, among other publications. Um, but I also mentioned a certain ex who had a more prominent role to play. Mm -hmm. um, and I, the time has come to reveal who this ex character is. Mm -hmm. He's a man by the name uh, Jonathan Frederick Bolter. And uh, Jonathan Bolter is well known um, in right-wing circles as the founder of the British New Right. Mm. And um, he is the person who me invited to the London Forum in February of 2017. And I brought Shaheen Najad along with me and secured a <coughs> spot for him to give a talk on um, basically Iranian nationalism. Interestingly, Jonathan Bolter did not attend my talk. After having brought me to London, having invited me to the London Forum, um, uh, never came upstairs. He, he was uh, seen downstairs that morning in the conference hotel, uh, but he refused to come upstairs. Um, and, um, you know, that's relevant because it's at that meeting uh, where um, the so-called Antifa infiltrator, Patrick Hermanson, first set his sights on me. So... There was another individual there uh, who was privy to some of the discussions that I had had with Jonathan, a man who I have to say I trust, and I've had some very uh, profound philosophical conversations with over the last year and a half, um, Darius Guppy. And... Uh, Darius did attend my talk. In fact, he came all the way from South Africa. He flew all the way from South Africa to attend my talk and to meet me in person after we had carried on a correspondence for some time. And Darius noted that Jonathan was insistent on not coming up to the venue. Uh, and yet, Jonathan sent up a man by the name of Potkin Ozarmer. My Iranian Renaissance associates, both Shaheen Najad, who was there to give a speech, and uh, Arya Salehi, uh, who was also present, um, they were quite taken aback by this because they knew Potkin Azarmer. And in fact, we had had an event in London a couple of days before that. You know, we wanted to kind of kill two birds with one stone while we were in town in London. We decided we'd hold an Iranian Renaissance conference. Potkin had been there at the Iranian Renaissance conference, but not as an audience member. He sat all the way in the back, off to one side, uh, with looks of, um, how can I put it, disapproval mm -hmm. on his face and taking notes. Mm -hmm. So effectively, he was spying on our session. And then he showed up in the London Forum. 
And he was sent up there by Jonathan, and he kind of, you know, snooped around, looked at the books on the book table, sat in the back for a while, and then uh, got up and left grumbling about how we were a bunch of Mosleyite fascists. At any rate, he's a person who certainly should not have been at our Iranian Renaissance event, and he most definitely had no place being at the London Forum. And I would like to know what in the hell he's doing with a reputed founder of the British New Right if he's someone aligned with the left. Mm -hmm. And why one of the founders of the British New Right send this leftist up to the London Forum meeting, which he set up for me, the London Forum mm -hmm. talk that he set up for me, at which I was the keynote speaker. Mm -hmm. Why did he send the leftist up and then not attend himself? And how interesting it is that that's where this Antifa infiltrator first sets his sights on me. When Patrick Hermanson and I met, uh, when I finally agreed to meet with this alleged graduate uh, student in New York, uh, you know, during the conversation where he clandestinely um, filmed me, he began by introducing himself as a, you know, a person who, I, who had met me at the London Forum. So that's very suspicious. It was an extremely exclusive, by invitation only list of people mm. who were. Uh, in that room. Jonathan Frederick Bolter certainly isn't what he seemed to be. Um, I subsequently found out that this man, uh, from the 1990s into the early 2000s, was involved with communist groups. He would uh, sign his letters to communist groups, all things Soviet. Mm. He was involved with anarchist groups, claiming to be an anarchist. He was involved with uh, Islamists. Mm -hmm. uh, I found connections between him and Fatullah Gulen's organization, which is going to become significant. Uh, actually, let me let me point out the significance of that right now. Okay, mm -hmm. when I had lunch with Michael Bagley uh, in New York for the first time, mm -hmm. he hinted that jellyfish played a role in the Gulenist coup attempt in Turkey, mm -hmm. and I subsequently found out that. Jonathan, who was the person who put me in touch with Michael, uh, was involved with Gulenists. Mm -hmm. So, guys involved with communists claiming to be a communist, and I have all this archived, by yes. the way, uh, involved with anarchists claiming to be an anarchist, involved with Islamists claiming to be an Islamist sympathizer, and I also have some correspondences of his, of his with Zionists claiming that he's looking for the Moshiach. Mm. And he's allegedly a founder of the the new right. Mm -hmm. In other words, a kind of neo-fascist or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I mentioned Zionists. Mm -hmm. Well, in the course of this involvement with um, geopolitics and an attempt to uh, facilitate a change of regime in Iran without any foreign military intervention or foreign meddling, uh, I had some communication with an Israeli uh, gentleman by the name of Avigdor Eskin, who, I want to be careful how I say this, but I, I'd say it's safe to say uh, he's done some work in the field of uh, intelligence. Mm -hmm. And um, he was an Israeli government liaison to um, apartheid South Africa. Mm -hmm. I think he's quite well known for that. Mm -hmm. And Eskin, in the course of casual conversation, uh, mentioned the work that Jonathan had done for British intelligence. Now, this was very late in my involvement with these people. Mm -hmm. um, it was um, a few months before the defamation. Mm -hmm. And uh, things had kind of petered out, you know, uh, before the defamation. I had really had it with these people and their repeated false promises of uh, funding for the alt-right corporation. Yes. I'll rewind and come mm -hmm. back to that uh, and the context for it in a moment. But at any rate, you know, uh, Eskin seemed to know that Jonathan was a British intelligence asset, uh, which would explain all of the shape-shifting. Yes. Jonathan Bolter was also an occultist, mm -hmm. and uh, some of the projects that he involved me with uh, were, as he put it, esoteric in nature. I subsequently discovered uh, that a member of um, more than a handful of various secret societies, including Freemasonry, mm -hmm. In particular, in a book called Confessions of an Illuminati, written by an associate of his, uh, Leo Leon Zagami, who 
converted to Islam and uh, sort of extricated himself from Jonathan's circles. In this confession written by Zagami, he repeatedly refers to Jonathan. Mm. And he lists a number of secret societies Jonathan was involved with, some of which I found independent confirmation for. I even found records of his initiation into certain groups in various parts of the world. Uh, Zagami claims that Jonathan is a member of the Illuminati. Jonathan made references to that himself in the time I was involved with him, which I kind of took half-jokingly. Um, but uh, the impression that one gets, both from what Zagami's written and from my own correspondences with Jonathan, which I've archived, I have a transcript of, you know, a couple of hundred pages of letters I exchanged with various individuals involved mm -hmm. with Jonathan and with this project over the past couple of years. Uh, the impression that you get from these correspondences and from, you know, what you can find in Zagami's writings and, and in other uh, references scattered deep in the Internet throughout, throughout the web um, is that there's some kind of interlinked mm -hmm. network of secret <laughs> societies. Mm -hmm. And the people who belong to all of these consider themselves the Illuminati. But Adam Weishaupt, after short, very shortly after he founded the Order of the Illuminati, whose symbol is a, an owl over an open book, mm -hmm. uh, Weishaupt, you know, was, he, he came under scrutiny by, I believe, Prussian authorities, um, and, uh, the, the Illuminati went underground and defined itself as a series of book clubs. Mm -hmm. So they maintained libraries. Mm -hmm. And this, this was their cover for their activities. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, Jonathan Bolter lists his official profession as librarian. Mm. And we met in a library. Uh, Jonathan took me to a building in the wealthiest part of London, which I have to say looked like something out of Eyes Wide Shut. It was a gigantic mansion. I think I didn't see a single other person there when we were there. It was empty, very high security, um, and it was full of libraries, mm. libraries around a central atrium. At any rate, uh, they took me to this place, presumably, you know, I had to leave a certain impression. And um, that's where we had uh, the first meeting where we seriously discussed the formation of the Alt-Right Corporation. Shortly after I joined the Iranian Renaissance, this Jonathan Bolter character started repeatedly, uh, repeatedly sending me messages. Yes. And I ignored him because the messages were crazy. Mm -hmm. He was claiming that he read Prometheus and Atlas, that it was a masterpiece, and he was the head of the British branch of the Vril Society, cult society in um, uh, 1917, eight, uh, 18. They were, they were a, a German occultists uh, who played a role in the formation of the Nazi party together mm -hmm. with the Thule Gesellschaft. The Thule Gesellschaft and the Vril Society, the Vril Gesellschaft, were the two occult societies that then spawned uh, the National Socialist German Workers' Party as a sort of political action committee mm -hmm. and um, political wing. Okay. And the Vril Society has also, also been traced uh, to the origins of exotic German propulsion research. Mm -hmm. um, they claimed to be in <coughs> telepathic communication with... Um, I don't know, extraterrestrials or survivors of some lost civilization and mm -hmm. so forth, yep. and uh, or survivors of, of Thule, mm. which is basically the Germanic conception of Atlantis. I see. And so this is what he claimed. He claimed mm -hmm. to be the British head of the Vril Society. I dismissed him. I thought, you know, okay, you know, when you talk about these kinds of subjects that we have in our interviews, lots of nutcases, mm -hmm. you know, um, turn up. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and it wasn't, the, these weren't the only, you know, half baked messages that I had been receiving from various people. Mm -hmm. But then at a certain point, uh, after I joined the Iranian Renaissance and he saw <laughs> I was actively involved again in Iranian, um, 
uh, political advocacy. Jonathan said that he had a contact with um, Michael Bagley, the president of Jellyfish, and that they could facilitate our work mm -hmm. uh, with respect to change of government in Iran. Yeah. Uh, and I looked up Jellyfish, I looked up Michael Bagley, and I, I looked fairly impressive. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, Wired and, and Mother Jones and so forth uh, were describing this organization as the salvaged intelligence directorate of Blackwater. Or after the various disasters in Iraq, Fallujah and so forth, Blackwater disintegrated. Um, and... Uh, Michael, who had been working with Eric Prince, salvaged the intelligence division of Blackwater. Mm -hmm. In other words, Blackwater minus the real heavy armaments and mercenary activity. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I figured, well, with one phone call, I can find out whether this guy is a nutcase or whether there's something legitimate here. Yep. Because presumably, if you're a nutcase, you know, and perhaps I shouldn't have presume this. If you're in that case uh, talking about, you know, telepathic communication with extraterrestrials and so on and so forth, you're not going to be involved with, you know, a really substantive private intelligence and security organization. It was my assumption. Yeah. And, well, now I see there are other ways that one could have looked at the situation. Yeah. Anyway, uh, I contacted Michael Bagley and uh, we had a very pleasant conversation. We started exchanging uh, letters and uh, we eventually met. Mm -hmm. And what we discussed was the use of a jellyfish uh, broadcasting facility in Croatia to bombard the Islamic Republic of Iran with uh, Iranian Renaissance propaganda. Mm -hmm. Which is something that, you know, I stand by. I think it was a perfectly uh, laudable aim. We wanted to increase the range of our um, uh, communications into Iran mm -hmm. and uh, deliver. A, I mean, propaganda is not necessarily the right word to use because it has some kind of, somehow a, an intrinsically negative connotation. Uh, but you know, in the positive sense, we were trying to get the Renaissance's message uh, to more Iranians, mm -hmm. um, which is a message of you know the the rebirth of pre-Islamic Persian culture. Mm -hmm. And so, this is the context in which I began to work with. Uh, Michael. Mm -hmm. Then Michael and Jonathan started talking about the alt-right. Yep. Because I had published Prometheus and Atlas with Arctos. And Arctos had connections to various people in the new European New Right or the American alt-right. And I, I was increasingly well respected in that community because of Prometheus and Atlas. Mm -hmm. Which, by the way, I didn't necessarily seek that. It was an outcome of the fact that I published this book with Arctos. So they noticed, Jonathan and, and, and Michael noticed, that I had a lot of pull mm -hmm. with these people. Yeah. And they said, okay, well, here's an idea. Uh, there's going to be funding um, for um, creating a kind of think tank that would be a policy advisement group to the Trump administration. Mm -hmm. Uh, kind of similar to the role that the neoconservatives had played under George W. Bush. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, the alt-right is very opposed to neoconservatives. I mean, they loathe neoconservatives uh, and are strong critics of George W. Bush. Mm -hmm. But in a formal sense, the idea was that we would be to the Trump administration what the neoconservative circles, the Straussians were, to the Bush administration. Mm -hmm. And they, they suggested there would be funding for this. Mm -hmm. uh, and that I could use my influence to integrate the alt-right mm -hmm. to, um, because I knew Hendrik Palmgren. Uh, I was on friendly terms with him. I'd done an interview with him on Prometheus and Atlas. But Hendrik and I also shared a lot of interests in common that had nothing to do with the alt-right. And Hendrik's Red Ice Radio and Television used to be a show very similar to Art Bell. It was only within like a year and a half before all of this that he had started talking about, you know, right-wing politics and mm. things like that. But, you know, his subject matters used to be the things that we're both interested in. Mm -hmm. And so w we had, you know, common, a common worldview to an extent. And uh, so I was positioned to be able to integrate Red Ice and Arctos mm -hmm. with Spencer's National Policy Institute. Mm -hmm. 
And Richard Spencer at the time, you know, while Trump was running against Hillary Clinton in the election, Richard Spencer was getting a lot of attention as the figurehead of the quote unquote alt right. And uh, what they said to me was, how about you become the leader of the alt right instead of Richard Spencer? Um, Michael Bagley literally used the phrase, quote, we can take Richard out hmm. and put you in hmm. as the head of the alt right. Yeah. So the idea was that I would integrate these structures and then I would be the head of the alt right mm -hmm. through a corporatization of this integrated structure. Mm -hmm. Because I wasn't going to become some, you know, as Richard has become now, r sort of, let's just put it this way, populist, mm -hmm. uh, rally leader. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, no, the idea was that I would be the chairman of a corporation mm -hmm. uh, by being the majority shareholder. Mm -hmm. So... They, they revealed to me that there was a project to build a constellation of micro cities across, well, this is what the term they used for it, micro cities across mm -hmm. North Africa mm -hmm. to contain the flow of migrants moving toward Europe and also to resettle migrants that had been expelled from Europe. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I have to say that, uh, to this day, I consider the European migration problem, I mean, the, um, uh, the problem with migrants in Europe, uh, migrants from, from the Arab world and, and from North Africa, to be an extremely serious security problem for Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think that those people should be there illegally. Mm -hmm. I didn't then and I still don't now. Okay. And so I was sympathetic to the idea mm -hmm. of resettling those people. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in relatively good conscience, um, I, I listened to this plan about the, the micro cities. And uh, this project was going to get a lot of funding, um, you know, multi billion dollar funding. Mm -hmm. And the idea was that as part of some larger cultural sort of, uh, you know, think tank dimension of this project, for solving the refugee problem in Europe uh, as part of a meta-political aspect of this project, this integrated alt-right structure would receive funding, um, you know, that would be a, a portion of the larger funding package. Mm -hmm. And in it, it was a drop in the bucket compared to the overall amount of funding being allocated for right. this project. Mm -hmm. They were talking about a sum of uh, about a million dollars. Mm -hmm. Uh, that they were offering me mm -hmm. to um, be a capital investment in the alt-right corporation mm -hmm. and uh, establish me as the majority shareholder and therefore the chairman. Mm -hmm. So you would have a board with, you know, Richard Spencer and Daniel Freeberg, the CEO of Arctos Media, and Henrik Palmgren, um, who founded Red Ice Radio and Television, and I would be the, the CEO of that, uh -huh. the, the majority shareholder of mm -hmm. that. Well, we we formed that board, we formed that corporation, mm -hmm. but the funding never came through. Right, and it was supposed to come through by by January of two thousand seventeen when we formed the alt right corporation. Um, and by the way, I discussed this plan uh, with Richard Spencer mm -hmm. um, at the Hamilton in in Washington D.C. one night. I I confessed the whole thing to him. I said, "Look, the." This is the Micro Cities Project, and these people are saying, Richard, you know, you can't walk into the White House and talk to Steve Bannon, um, but I can. Uh, and so you will have to play a more, um, you know, you can be a kind of people person, you, you know, you, you, you can be the populist face of this, but I'd have to be the point man who goes in and, and discusses things with Steve Bannon and uh, is the policy liaison mm -hmm. with the White House. And Newsweek you know, falsely, Newsweek falsely claimed based on their distortion of the New York Times report that I had said that I met with Steve Bannon. I never said any such thing. Uh, what I said was that it was part of the proposal mm -hmm. that uh, Michael and Jonathan had come up with, that I would meet with Steve mm -hmm. Bannon because Michael was meeting with President Trump and with Vice President Pence on a regular basis. He was in the White House regularly. He had contact with Steve Bannon. Um, and 
You know, I know this because he introduced me to other people subsequently, uh, like, for example, Walid Faris, um, who he described to me as the shadow secretary of state. He said mm -hmm. to me, Tillerson's just a front man. Walid is deep state. He, wor he works with us. He's been working with us. And, you know, when you meet with him, imagine that you're speaking directly to President Trump mm -hmm. regarding Iran policy. Yeah. And I know later on, based on things that happen later on, that it is true that Walid is the real policy make foreign policy maker, at least with respect to the Iran issue in the Middle East. Okay. He wrote President Trump's Arabian Gulf speech, mm. the quote unquote, we call it in the Persian community, the Arabian Gulf speech, where President Trump uh, unforgivably referred to the Persian Gulf as the Arabian Gulf mm -hmm. and laid out a plan for how to confront the Islamic Republic involving mm -hmm. particularly the targeting of the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps. That speech was written by Walid Faris. Uh, and um, I think he's one of the architects of the plan that's currently uh, being implemented with respect to regime change in Iran. In terms of my own involvement with these individuals, so th they promised the funding in January of 2017, which is when we for formed the Alt-Right Corporation, uh, and the funding didn't come through. I was repeatedly given excuses. They told me that... Uh, you know, General Flynn being removed from the Trump administration was part of a, a larger um, assault on the administration by people that Barack Obama had left in place uh, and that um, until uh, s extreme scrutiny of the Trump administration by these Obama appointees could be s circumvented or neutralized they would not be able to release this funding. Mm -hmm. That's what they said. Yep. In other words, like there was something about the funding for the micro cities project uh, that made it such that it could not be released um, while these people from the former administration were still in key positions. Mm. And so they were going to go about trying to remove them. They repeatedly delayed the funding and made up all kinds of excuses between January and May of mm -hmm. 2017. Uh, during the course of which, you know, I had increasingly serious problems with my partners in the Alt-Right Corporation. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to get too much into the details of that because it's just sort of, it, 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 yeah. Uh, what really matters is this. I lost control of the corporation. Mm -hmm. I was supposed to be the CEO of this thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and it kind of became a Frankenstein's monster. Um, that escaped my control because they were repeatedly making me false promises. Yeah. I was making promises, uh, yeah. d giving reassurances to my partners, which mm -hmm. turned out uh, to be hollow. Yeah. And so I started losing credibility with them. But then mm -hmm. they also, there were also machinations on their part, mm -hmm. which were unwise, mm -hmm. which... Uh, involved decreasing my uh, ability to control mm -hmm. the direction that the corporation took. Right. Uh, to the point where, you know, by the summer of 2017, I couldn't endorse uh, the activities of this organization. Mm -hmm. uh, the plan was to turn a, an embryonic white nationalist movement in America and a kind of isolationist, uh, xenophobic European movement in Europe into... Uh, an Indo-European global movement that mm -hmm. would offer humanity a new vision of world order. Yeah. That was the discussion that mm -hmm. we had. And I have to tell you, I dis it may be hard for you to believe, but I discussed this with Richard Spencer in detail. Mm -hmm. And he was on board. Mm -hmm. So, you know, people who think that Richard is some hardcore white nationalist what no it's not the case he doesn't have that firm of an ideology and should sufficient funding have materialized he was perfectly willing to go in another direction so and then you know i was the editor-in-chief of arctos mm -hmm. so part of this plan was not only that i would bring this capital investment to the alt-right corporation as a whole but I was supposed to become the majority shareholder at Arctos as well. Mm. And that publishing company, up to the point where it was integrated by me, unfortunately, into the alt-right corporation, had no definite ideology. So what I had been thinking was to, to push Arctos in the direction of, you know, uh, even more engagement with various global cultures. Mm -hmm. You know, they had been publishing some Hindu philosophical texts and so forth some texts relevant to Buddhism and other mystical traditions. I wanted to do a lot more of that, mm -hmm. uh, publish more novels and fiction and so forth. And, 
you know, take Arctos in the opposite direction mm -hmm. as it has in fact gone in yeah. since Richard Spencer ran away with the corporation that was my idea. Mm -hmm. So, um, that's what we had been thinking and that's how it, it got out from, you know, my control, got out of my control due to the lack of promised funding. Uh, and then, you know, by the time Charlottesville happened, in, um, in the Iranian Renaissance, we were also forming something called the Iranian United Front, mm -hmm. a coalition of uh, nationalist, patriotic Iranian political parties that cut across the distinction between mon monarchists and advocates of a secular republic. I introduced the coalition in the English language mm -hmm. at that event. Uh, and uh, that event took place on the day of Charlottesville. Mm -hmm. It was quite dramatic. I was sitting there with these Iranian associates and there's a huge screen TV, you know, with CNN showing what my partners are doing in Charlottesville. Mm -hmm. And I was put in a, you know, I already was extremely disillusioned by the direction that the alt-right corporation had been going in. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was it. That was the straw that broke the camel's back. I mm -hmm. said, no, no, I'm at this. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm going to commit myself full-time to the Iranian United Front mm -hmm. and the Iranian Renaissance, which is the cultural backbone of that coalition. Mm -hmm. So I submitted my resignation, and I submitted my resign. I publicly resigned from the Alt Right Corporation. Mm -hmm. I think four or five days later, mm -hmm. uh, from San Francisco. Now I'll tell you why I was in San Francisco. I had mentioned that Jonathan Bolter is an occultist, yes. besides being involved in geopolitics, and I confess that it wasn't just uh, the possibilities, the, the capabilities that they were offering us in terms of access to um, the Iranian people through satellite broadcasting and so forth that appealed to me. Uh, Jonathan dangled various esoteric projects in mm -hmm. front of me. And uh, one of them was this um, advanced energy and propulsion project, mm -hmm. which is called Project Songbird. That's the classified name for it, allegedly, mm -hmm. Project Songbird. And they have this project being led, Jonathan's people have this project being led by a uh, NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory um, scientist by the name of Randall Milkey. Mm -hmm. And um, told me that uh, Songbird was a kind of retrofitting, uh, remodeling of the German... Uh, Glocke or Bell project to the stand to the standards of our contemporary technology. 1940s German zero point energy and anti gravity propulsion project mm -hmm. uh, called Die Glocke or the Bell. The formal name for the project was Project Kronos. And what he alleged was that Randall was working on a kind of miniaturization of this. Um, to the standard of contemporary technological capabilities. Mm -hmm. So he had noticed that I had been having uh, various interactions with Jacques Vallée and um, he sent me to Jacques in San Francisco with Randall. Mm -hmm. And this is the uh, second time that I had been meeting with Jacques in San Francisco. Um, and I exchanged a number of letters with Jacques Vallée before this, expressing my cynicism and skepticism about these people. Because at this mm -hmm. point, they had repeatedly delayed the funding for the Alt-Right Corporation. Mm -hmm. And what I actually wanted was for uh, Jacques, who, who has decades of experience dealing with uh, the close encounter phenomenon and associated technology from the perspective of a venture capitalist in the field of advanced technology, uh, and also from the perspective of someone who had written about scam artists in the close encounter phenomenon, you know, the right. book Messengers of Deception yes. was all about, you know, various uh, cults and, um, you know, groups of scam artists mm -hmm. uh, using the discourse of the UFO phenomenon in order to accomplish various quasi-criminal ends. And... So I had written to Jacques, I, I, I would like your opinion on these people. 
Mm -hmm. uh, if, if you're willing to even entertain this at all, which, by the way, if you aren't, I'll just basically tell him to go to hell. Mm -hmm. uh, I had written that, and I have an archive of all yep. these correspondences. Mm -hmm. And he said, no, it sounds interesting. You know, uh, it sounds interesting. Mm -hmm. I would like to, if I'm cleared, classification-wise, to, you know, look at this project, uh, sure, I, I'd like to take a look. Mm -hmm. So I... I brought Randall uh, to a meeting with Jacques at the Fairmont in, in San Francisco. And Jacques and I were supposed to have a private meeting later in the same week. But he had some trouble with his ears and had to have some, some surgery. And so the second meeting was canceled, which is terribly unfortunate because he was supposed to give me his private impressions of Randall and the project. Because I'm not a physicist. I don't understand the physics involved in this yeah. or the engineering involved in this and whether it's legitimate or not. Mm -hmm. But I figured he would have a, a greater understanding of that. At any rate, Randall came to this meeting with a, you know, uh, schematics mm -hmm. for a device that involved electromagnetism, uh, mercury isotope, and uh, it, had, it had the basic principles of, of the bell, which by that time I had studied because it had been mentioned by Jonathan. Mm -hmm. uh, yet it was, it was miniaturized mm -hmm. and it was a modular design. In other words, you could make one of these that was small enough to fit inside a car mm -hmm. and levitate a car, mm -hmm. or you could make one that was much larger uh, for a, a, you know, I don't know, a larger aerial craft, mm -hmm. uh, or or even, I suppose, for use in a naval vessel of a some battleship, kind. battleship, huh? Yeah, battleship, something okay. like that, right? And it, it was a very elegant modular design. I have to say, at the meeting, Jacques didn't express all that much skepticism. He didn't, you know, just yeah. wave this guy off. He had some questions about how this could lead to anti-gravity. Mm -hmm. He said that uh, it was an interesting way of generating energy, which he believed that it could do. Mm -hmm. And he told, he asked Randall whether um, he had a patent on this, mm -hmm. uh, to which Randall's response was basically no, because it's not, we didn't, I didn't come up with this. I'm mm -hmm. modifying an existing technology. And Jacques, uh, Jacques said basically, well, look, this is so different from whatever you're working with, you know, from the 1940s that really you should put an original patent on this. Mm -hmm. And I'm not really even comfortable as a venture capital looking at this, uh, without your having a patent on mm -hmm. it. So, so point being, it's not like he was totally dismissive. Right. And so we had this meeting. And I reported back to Jonathan about it. Uh, and so that's why I was in San Francisco mm -hmm. when I resigned yes. from the alt right corporation. That's what was going on. Mm -hmm. One of these bizarre projects he was involved with was a genetics clinic, which allegedly was based in India, but had a branch in Newport Beach, California. Mm -hmm. And they were uh, supposedly trying to clone material that had been... Uh, extracted from tombs of uh, prehistoric um, people mm -hmm. in Peru and Egypt and other locations in the world. And the way Jonathan described this to me in the second meeting that we had together in London, not that first one mm -hmm. in this, you know, palatial building, uh, in the second meeting we had in London, he described this to me as an attempt to restore the genetics of a kind of pure strain of Cro-Magnon, who they believed uh, were responsible for what we call Atlantis, mm -hmm. some high civilization in remote antiquity. Okay. And uh, they, they, he claimed that his group was involved with uh, right-wing Hindus who uh, were who, whose belief in the caste system and whose belief that these beings were like the devas mm -hmm. of Hindu mythology was being used, I guess, to motivate them to work on this project mm. and to allocate resources mm. for this project. Mm. Uh, and it had a branch at a clinic in Newport Beach. Now, why was he telling me this? Because I was involved with a Persian nanotechnology innovator in Newport Beach, a man by the name of Fariborz Masi, mm -hmm. who made a fortune uh, with innovations in the area of um, uh, microelectrical mechanical systems. Mm -hmm. And uh, Fariborz Masi became what he describes as a venture philanthropist. Mm -hmm. So he had flown me out to Newport Beach to teach him, believe it or not, the Gathas of Zarathustra. Um, so I had a connection with this guy. And when I was in San Francisco, uh, he contacted me 
and wanted me to come back to Los Angeles. I had been in Los Angeles forming the Iranian United Front with my Renaissance colleagues, yes. went to San Francisco, and then Ferry Boris Massey wanted me to come back to Los Angeles, actually to Newport Beach, mm -hmm. and have some conversations mm -hmm. with him. Yep. I hadn't heard from him for a long time. Mm -hmm. And so Jonathan asked me to make Ferry Boris aware of the genetics clinic in Newport Beach, basically you know, in the shadow of his own club there, mm -hmm. uh, where we would meet, and see if uh, he would be interested in this project. Mm -hmm. now, he asked me things like, is Ferry Boris interested in the esoteric and the yeah. occult? And the answer was yes. Uh, so, and at any rate, yes, he damaged my relationship with Jacques Vallée, and I think he wanted to damage my relationship with Ferry Boris Massy, mm -hmm. who frankly was a billionaire who wanted to invest in me mm -hmm. as a venture philanthropist. Yeah. And... The reason I did not propose this to Ferry Bors during that visit after the formation of the Iranian United Front was because Ferry Bors proposed that I write the new constitution of Iran. That was why he had brought me out to mm -hmm. Newport Beach. Is yep. you know after a couple of days of conversations uh, with him, he he confessed that the reason he had actually brought me out there mm -hmm. was that he had information that. There was going to be a regime change in Iran, and we needed to prepare for um, a new constitutional order. In other words, we should not al allow conditions comparable to what happened in Iraq mm -hmm. after the American military invasion of Iraq. There shouldn't be a vacuum. Mm -hmm. We should develop a constitution that will be in the best interests of, of the Iranian people and uh, in tune with the fundamental principles of Persian culture. I become Iran's Thomas Jefferson, mm -hmm. and he was going to fund it mm -hmm. in a serious way. Yeah. And by fund it, I, I don't mean just fund me to write it. I, he was going to put his weight behind it mm -hmm. and make the connections mm -hmm. necessary to try to get mm -hmm. this accepted as the Iran's proposed constitution. Okay. This was mid-August. Mm -hmm. Actually, later than that. August 15 was my resignation from the Alt-Right Corporation from San Francisco. Yeah. Then I went to Newport Beach, so that puts us into mid to late August, mm -hmm. and the defamation in the New York Times came out on mm -hmm. September 18th. It's hard not to ascribe some degree of credibility to people who deal in billion-dollar oil contracts. Mm -hmm. At one point, when the funding failed to come through for the Alt-Right Corporation, Jonathan Bolter sent me an itemized nearly $1 billion oil contract for the reconstruction of the Venezuelan national oil industry. Mm -hmm. And he asked me to pass it on to um, a petroleum engineer mm -hmm. at a leading uh, oil company, mm -hmm. one of the world's leading oil companies. And... Uh, this uh, engineer came back and said that the the oil he had met with his superiors and he had said that the oil company didn't have the capability to carry out this particular project. Mm -hmm. It wasn't um, in line with their specializations, yeah. which is a really good thing mm -hmm. because it turns out that within now, I, but Jonathan had told me when he handed me the contract, he said, "This is almost a lit direct quote." We're, we're going to overthrow the government of Venezuela mm -hmm. and we need to get into the oil industry there before we do that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I had no great love for Chavez and Chavez, see, Hugo Chavez was like this with Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. Mm -hmm. And when the Iranian people rose up in 2009 against the Islamic Republic, Hugo Chavez came out and said, that the whole thing was a CIA operation and that the people on the streets were basically like shills for the CIA and they should be cut down. Mm -hmm. So I had no great love for the, the caretaker post-Chavez government in Venezuela, you know, the, the government that had taken over from Chavez, Maduro's government, yeah. and was pursuing Chavez's policies. Mm -hmm. So frankly, to me, moving that government from Venezuela was not a problem, mm -hmm. ethically. Right. Uh, because, you know, he had treated the Iranian people horrendous. That government had treated the Iranian people mm -hmm. horrendously. Yeah. So he said, okay, we're, you know, we're going to remove the Maduro government and we need to get into the oil industry before we do that. And here's this contract and see if so-and-so can do it. Why? Because the commission from the contract mm -hmm. more than covered 
the funding for the mm -hmm. alt-right corporation. Uh -huh. and we were looking at a million dollars. This was a billion-dollar yeah. oil contract. Mm -hmm. The commission for closing a deal like that would have been a lot more than a million dollars. Within two months mm -hmm. of my handling this oil contract, which I have to this day, uh, and I've included it in the addenda to you know the document I've written about all these events, within two months of my handling that oil contract, um, protests began against Maduro's government in Venezuela, and there was a, a full-scale coup attempt in mm -hmm. that country, mm -hmm. which Maduro put down by rounding up the oil bosses. Mm. So, you see, you can't just say that these people are a bunch of, you know, petty con artists. These people were behind the coup attempt in Venezuela. These people were probably behind the coup attempt in Turkey, which got thousands of people killed mm -hmm. by Erdogan right. in reprisal. Uh, these people have, uh, you know, satellite broadcast capabilities. They're dealing in billion-dollar mm -hmm. contracts. Uh, they're certainly involved in esoteric projects, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's, uh, you know, advanced propulsion or bizarre cloning and genetic yeah. engineering projects or other projects that had to do with psychic phenomena. Jonathan wanted me to introduce him to John Poynton, mm -hmm. the head of the British Society for Psychical Research, yeah. and he wanted to form a secret group inside the British SPR, which would not be answerable to the board of the British SPR, and which would conduct psychic research. Mm -hmm. And I, I did introduce Jonathan to... Um, to Jonathan, mm -hmm. uh, to John Poynton. Yes. Uh, and uh, John Poynton, to his credit, uh, yeah, he has to be given a lot of credit for the fact that he r flatly refused to do this and that the, you know, the protocols, the institutional protocols of the British SPR would not allow for something like this. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, yeah, let me, let me leave it at that. You know, mm -hmm. he, he already had seen what happened to the American SPR uh, and, and was not interested in any, you know, um, operations that would compromise the integrity of the British mm -hmm. SPR. So mm -hmm. it's a good thing he protected himself and, and his organization from that attempt to infiltrate it on the part of these people. Mm -hmm. But my point is that they're also involved in psychic, psychical yeah. research. Mm -hmm. And again, remember, I, I found evidence, uh, and I have documented evidence, that Jonathan belongs to more than a handful of the most elite uh, occult societies yeah. in the world. Mm -hmm. He's part of a wrecking crew. Yeah. For who? Uh, Avigdor Eskin told me he works with British intelligence. Mm -hmm. So, now, um, I also found that Jonathan was investigated by British intelligence in his youth mm -hmm. when he was running a, believe it or not, paranormal research organization in London. Mm. Uh, something like the Organization for the Study of Anomalous Phenomena, or something mm -hmm. like that. And he was running it mm -hmm. at a relatively young age. And he got involved with some right-wing occultists in France who, according to British intelligence, were the priory of Sion, and they had plans to install the Merovingian dynasty again across Europe. Mm. And this was considered uh, extraterritorial activity that threatened the interests of the British state. Mm -hmm. And so Jonathan was investigated by British intelligence. And I think what happened is that as a relatively young man put in a vice by British intelligence, mm -hmm. he probably turned. Jonathan himself admitted this, mm -hmm. that hope not hate is a British intelligence front. After the defamation happened to me and I basically, yeah. you know, grabbed these guys and said, look, you're responsible for this, at least for putting me in a position where funding didn't come through and associating me with the alt-right, at least in that respect, you're responsible. And Jonathan confessed, hope not hate is a British intelligence front. So if he's British intelligence and hope not hate is a British intelligence front and Patrick Hermanson met me at an event of the London Forum that Jonathan set up for me, which he himself did not attend, who's responsible for that clandestine video footage collected by Patrick Hermanson and why was it released when it was? Uh, I think they were concerned about the role I might play in Iran's political mm -hmm. future. Yeah. I, I think that, you know, that it gives a, a kind of uh, general overview of the context for the defamation that took place mm -hmm. uh, on September 19th. Um, so, you know, what one has to understand is that when I was meeting with Patrick Hermanson, the other thing is that, you know, the London Forum asked me four times to meet with this graduate 
student. Mm -hmm. And I, I wouldn't respond to a lot of these messages. Finally, he showed up in New York. And with the attitude that I have, you know, I felt I felt bad about not meeting with him yeah. now that he's come all this way, mm -hmm. you know, from Europe. Uh, he was a Swede, but he was in, in London. And so I, I agreed to meet with him. But, you know, the London Forum put a lot of pressure on me to meet with this guy. Mm -hmm. And so when I was meeting with him, I was meeting with him as a representative of the alt-right. Mm -hmm. But what people shouldn't forget, although the video has been taken badly at my remarks in the surreptitiously recorded video... Um, have been taken badly out of context. What people shouldn't forget is that my being a representative of the alt-right was part of a larger project mm -hmm. involving intelligence and security yeah. and geopolitics. Mm -hmm. I was playing a role yeah. for the purposes of reorienting that movement um, for the benefit of Iran and for the benefit of humanity. Mm -hmm. And so, what I said to Patrick Hermanson was not meant for the public, and it was not meant as a represent uh, representation of who I am. It's the video uh -huh. after my resignation. Uh -huh. The video was taken in early summer of 2017. Uh, I see. So, you have to understand, the person that Patrick Hermanson sat down with mm -hmm. in, the, in that pub in the shadow of the Empire State Building, that person was a man positioning himself to be the leader of the alt-right. Mm -hmm. And this graduate student was allegedly some hardcore alt-right youth. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's a context here. Right. He wasn't sitting down with Jason Giorgiani, the philosopher. Mm -hmm. He was sitting down with Jason Giorgiani, potential chairman of the alt-right corporation. Yep. You know what, fine, let me just say this. Uh, one reason why I agreed to get involved with the alt-right is because for years I have had a vision of the return of fascism. Mm -hmm. As someone who's thought deeply about the future, yeah. uh, for a variety of reasons, um, I believe that we will see a return of fascism in an even more totalitarian form than what we saw in the 1920s and 30s, unless something is done to stop that. Mm -hmm. And so what I wanted to do was, I mean, again, it's important to remember, I didn't come up with this idea. These people put this project in front of me. Yeah. And they connected it to, to operations that would have been uh, to the benefit of the Iranian people. That's mm -hmm. how they hooked me. Right. Hey, I have had a nightmarish vision of the formation of basically a world government, mm -hmm. which would be fascist in nature. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's the best word that you have to describe it. Actually, let me put it to you this way. Julius Evola uh, is famous for having said that he is not a fascist because fascism is too progressive. Evola said, I am an advocate of tradition. And from the standpoint of tradition, fascism is, is degenerate, decadent, and progressive. Okay. Because there are left-wing elements in fascism, particularly mm -hmm. in Benito Mussolini's version of fascism, mm -hmm. which evolved out of anarcho-syndicalism. The futurist movement was closely connected to Mussolini's fascism, and they were yeah. very progressive people sure. in, in a kind of right-wing sense. The point is that what Evola stands for, a, a global traditionalist government that would be extremely hierarchical, uh, that would resemble the Hindu caste system in a technological age. What things will begin to look like round about the middle of the 21st century and onward. Mm -hmm. the, the problem is that there are certain people who position themselves to be the ones that usher in this world government. Mm -hmm. And their ideological orientation is, let's say, totalitarian, hierarchical, paternalistic, uh, and will constrain innovation and the cultivation of the human individual, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, ideals that I consider um, to be, uh, you know, at the core of my own mm -hmm. worldview. Um, leftists, the progressives in our world today, so-called progressives, so-called liberals, they're neither progressive nor liberal, are absolutely clueless when they, uh, you know, endorse illegal mass Muslim migration into Europe and uh, other policies that will result in a return of fascism in a much more virulent form. Mm -hmm. And so I, I 
didn't think that any opposition from the outside would be able to resist this. I also don't think any international opposition will be able to resist it. In other words, despite the rising power of China, um, the vision that I had was one of a Chinese superpower basically handing control over to this group of people once, once they uh, declared themselves, once they emerged from out of the shadows. Mm -hmm. And so the only way I thought that this could be, that this nightmare could be averted uh, is if in the embryonic stage of this movement toward that future, uh, it could be re-engineered mm -hmm. in a way that would take it in a different direction mm -hmm. and that would also um, introduce a, uh, how can I put it, um, introduce a dynamic disequilibrium into the core structure ideological and political structure of what would evolve into this government. Mm -hmm. Introduce a dynamic disequilibrium, a certain degree of internal tension. And I had that in the back of my mind mm -hmm. as I agreed to be this uh, unifying figure in the alt-right. Mm -hmm. Because let me tell you, something a lot more terrifying than Richard Spencer uh, could materialize mm -hmm. on the political horizon of humanity. People like Richard, like Daniel Freeberg, I knew I could work with them at this early stage to take things in a direction that would avert that future. Mm -hmm. And it would require, you know, finding solutions to problems like Muslim migration in Europe or the problem of the rise of political Islam in general uh, before things reached a catastrophic crisis. Mm -hmm. And the Iranian Renaissance was a huge part of that solution as far as I was concerned. Mm -hmm. Frankly, that's what Prometheus and Atlas is about. Mm -hmm. Prometheus and Atlas is a work of deconstruction. It is aiming to deconstruct a world order that does not yet exist mm -hmm. from the deepest level, from the archetypal level. The idea was to, in a way, Prometheus and Atlas is a prophetic work. The idea was to envision the archetypal basis for this world order, but then alchemically transform it uh, from within. Mm -hmm. uh, to, in other words, elaborate their own vision more eloquently and um, more in a more compelling fashion than they themselves would be able to long in advance of their own proposals so that uh, as the vanguard for the social and political order that they wanted to bring into being, um, whatever organization coalesced around the vision of Prometheus and Atlas would be able to recalibrate the mm -hmm. trajectory of this uh, tsunami of, of change that I think is coming. I was trying to avert a future where hundreds of millions of people are going to be killed. Mm -hmm. And, and I, this is going to sound, you know, I don't know, we, I don't know if we'll release this video or not because this is going to sound megalomaniacal, but the fact of the matter is, and this mm -hmm. is why it really does make me angry, what these people did. Mm -hmm. We are headed toward that future now. And they are going to be responsible for the deaths of hundreds of millions of people, which I had a damn good chance at averting. I can't tell you how many people have written to me from the European New Right and American Alt Right saying, your vision is the vision. This garbage that Richard Spencer is peddling is not going to take us anywhere. Prometheus and Atlas is the Bible of our movement. I really could have led that thing. And I could have carried out diplomatic negotiations on a geopolitical scale in order to create a structure which preempted and uh, supplanted what it is that these people are planning to bring into being. I had a good chance at it. And mm -hmm. you know what? I think that's why I was targeted. Mm -hmm. They created a scenario in advance. It's like if you want to, you know something is going to materialize and so then you create conditions for it to come into being prematurely so that there's a miscarriage. I think that's basically what was done here.
in how I shaped Prometheus and Atlas mm -hmm. and, you know, what kind of a project I was going to unfold over a long term, very carefully, very carefully. And then they came and they, they set the whole thing up for me long before, uh, let, let, let's say, in an overly hasty fashion, mm -hmm. in an overly hasty fashion, and not backed by proper resources, so that the whole thing would miscarry. It, it really is, it's, it's, it's awful. And, mm -hmm. you know, I can't help but to wonder whether, you know, the guy came and introduced himself to me as the head of the Vril Society mm -hmm. in Britain. Yeah. You know, I mean, that was a fascist, occultist organization. Um, suppose he is British intelligence. Intelligence agencies are infiltrated uh, routinely. Mm -hmm. In the United States, you know, we imported thousands of, of Nazi German scientists yeah. uh, from 1944 to 1947 um, as part of Operation Paperclip. And when Eisenhower gave his speech warning about the military industrial complex, what he was talking about was the Nazi intelligence corporate industrial complex in this country. Nazi German penetration of the most secure levels of American intelligence and uh, industry. That's what he was talking. He was talking about the danger of the, the unintended consequences of paperclip. Mm -hmm. And you know, British were our allies and partners in the war against Germany. So we don't know to what extent, you know, British intelligence has been infiltrated by who or what, you know. Th there was certainly a faction within the British government during the Second World War that wanted a detente with Hitler. Mm. Uh, and, and by the way, I mean, Jonathan made reference to some of these people when I was in, in London mm -hmm. um, as associates of his. So at any rate, what they've done is, is put us all in a much more difficult position. Um, we're still on that track that leads to a nightmarish totalitarian future. Aces of that nature are going to be exploited by these people. There's going to be an ecological collapse. There are going to be pandemics. Uh, uh, there, there are going to be all kinds of threats to social order and reasons for declarations of state of states of emergency mm -hmm. across this planet, yeah. which will afford the opportunity for you know the rise of uh, ultimately an integrated totalitarian political system.